In one year in the United States, there are about half a million divorces. There's about a million men and women who look for lifelong happiness with each other, admit that they had not found it. It means many thousands of children who need the security of a home and parents lose it. It means that for every four couples who get married, one is divorced. It means that with every passing year, more American marriages face the probability of failure. Perhaps it means that the basic reasons for these divorces preceded the marriages. Why did this charming couple wind up in court? Why did it have to happen this way for them? Whose fault was it? What was wrong? Was it bad luck? Was it hate? For before they became bride and groom, these two were in love. Did you ever see such a day, Ken? Grandma used to say it's so healthy around here they had to shoot a man to start a graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> they say Johnny Appleseed went by this way. Winnie, you've opened up a whole new world for me. Oh, Ken, the ring. You've squeezed so hard. Isn't it rich looking and unusual? <laughs> and inexpensive, too. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, I can hardly wait until September to get away. It'll be such fun to be together all the time, and we'll be so close to everything in New York. Art shows and foreign films, and well, I'll even see the ocean for the first time. Ken, do you leave your razor blades lying around? <laughs> Don't be a fellow scene, Winnie. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a lucky thing Fran found us a two and a half off campus. But what will we put in it? Well, that little Picasso sketch I picked up, that goes in the living room. It's a masterpiece. And the Bendix? You take care of the homemaking. I'll look after the books and records. No male supremacy now, Professor. It doesn't go with your salary. Ken, do you like babies? <laughs> sure. Your own? Well, I hadn't thought of it. Are you insured, Ken? No. Why? Well, we know so awfully little about one another, don't we? Wouldn't it be nice if we could just wander up a road like this with never a care? <laughs> oh, yes, darling, but someday we've got to stop and think things out. <laughs> sure, but I'm awful hungry right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on. <laughs> a man chases a woman until she catches him. Oh, Ken, isn't this heaven? Ken, let's not think too far ahead yet. Let's just fill every second with... with minutes. Nothing's changed, has it, Ken? Of course not, Angel. I'm still a mystery to you. As mysterious as life itself. I wanted to stay this way forever and ever. The earth and the grass hold grand international confabulation with the sun, while man, the stumbler and finder, goes on. But, Ken, that's beautiful. You're a great writer. A teacher of great writing, Winnie. That was your most famous poet. Sandberg, I know. But, Ken, you're going to be greater than he. You're going to be one of the most famous novelists in America. If I ever get the novel written. What do you mean, if? Of course you will. That depends on how easy you are to catch with a typewriter. I never run away from you. Not really. Sometimes you do. I think I've caught the way you talk or feel, but when I try to put the words on paper, they don't ring true. I realize that I don't know you well enough to recreate you. You will, Ken. I have all the faith in the world in you. Winnie, do you always have to pick things? 
Why not? You see a flower and you think of Sandberg or Whitman. I see a flower and I want to wear it in my hair or put it in a vase. Nature was kind to your face, Winnie. Oh, I like compliments. I wish you'd take off that powder, though. And show my freckles. <laughs> well, they're yours, aren't they? <laughs> Don't the girls in New Orleans have freckles? No, they stay out of the sun. Well, I didn't. I used to tumble around and climb fences, and you want to see the scars on my knees? <laughs> You're such a faker. Same as you. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, am I fun to be with? <laughs> oh, Ken, I like your laugh. You laugh with your eyes. You know, when you're a hundred, I'll be a hundred and five. I want to die before you do, Ken. Blue eyes say, love me or I die. Brown eyes say, love me or I kill you. Oh, Mr. Instructor, if your students could only see you now. <laughs> Did you have a good time? Wonderful. I've got to change. At first, I thought it was only a summer romance. Ken would soon be going back to his regular teaching job in the East. But I was wrong. I like Ken all right, but I feel more comfortable with Joe. We know the same steps, like the same books. She could have got engaged to so many nice boys and Tom. They used to shower her with attention, put her on a pedestal. I guess they were too easy to get. Sometimes I think she just wants to get away from home. But that's Winnie. Always searching for something beyond her reach. She has to know as much or more than anybody else. No wonder they gave her a job in the dean's office when she graduated. She was a star in her own little world. She could breathe life into the dullest routine. She made things go the way she wanted them to. The girls loved her. She was so charming and helpful. I was sure she wouldn't give it up for anything in the world. She seemed to be made for a career. Darling man, help me with my zipper. Don't jump around so much. Oh, I look a mess. You never look better. Am I too showy? Some of Ken's friends are coming in from the East today. I want him to be proud of me. There they are. Bye, May. Bye. Have a good time. Honeymoon's all set? I still can't believe it, Ken. You were so delightfully <laughs> unattached. <laughs> Don't worry, Winnie. You're the most charming of them all. Ken, I know where I can get you some lovely odd chairs. Very functional. Oh? But I thought we were going to have early American, darling. <laughs> you can trust Fran, Winnie. Her taste is faultless. Why don't we go watch the moon, Peter, while they plan a home for me? <laughs> oh, I, I wouldn't dare, Winnie. I, I might lose my head. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you tell Fran about your novel, Ken? Is it a secret? Yes, our secret. Why, Ken, I didn't know you had it in you. You just haven't appreciated him. It won't be long before the whole world knows the real Ken. Do tell me about it. I'd rather not. It's a little early, or late, rather. Shall we go? Don't you think we make a charming couple? Did I make an impression, Ken? You did all right. 
I wanted so much to do the right thing. I know. But I felt so... so left out. That could happen to anybody. Ken, are they all like Fran? Intellectuals, you mean? No snobs. You're imagining that, Winnie. You'll get used to them. It'll take time. To get elevated to her level, is that what you mean? Ken, how can you sit there and be so superior? Don't I count? Of course you do, Winnie. But you can't expect me to give up Fran and Pete. They're my kind of people. I'd hope that we'd be like them. Well, I don't want to be like her. But what's the matter with Fran and Pete, are Ken, I think you better take me home. If that's what you want, sure. Why not? Hasn't this gone a little too far? It certainly has. But you can't expect me to be any different from what I am. Don't you expect to change, even a little? After all, I've been giving up everything in the world for you. But what if I don't write that novel? Ken, you don't seem to realize yourself how good you are. No wonder Peter. But I've never had anything published. You're being unfair. Why? Because I want you to be famous? Ken, you don't realize how exciting a writer's life can be. There's no greater thrill in the world. Can't you be just a college professor's wife? Isn't that enough? And play ghost to your Hamlet. Oh, no, I'm not going to sit at home with the four walls and count pennies or alter myself to suit your friend's tastes. Winnie, I love you. And I love you, Ken. But I'm not going to let you change me. You're not going to change me either. I've got to feel free to be myself even after we're married. Well, that goes for me, too. He was in one of those moods again, and late as usual. But he was very popular and nobody minded, of course. He liked to hold his class outdoors when the weather was nice. He called it folk origins of American poetry. But Lit 131 was more than that, really, much more. He had read a lot and traveled widely and was a brilliant lecturer. But he was too easygoing. There was no discipline at all. He was so informal and so impersonal, I didn't think he could belong to anyone. He used to invite me up to his room once in a while. I could never figure out his game. He enjoyed things much more than he enjoyed making something of himself. He liked to talk about the folklore of the country people the ballad singers and the musical instruments. He took pleasure in new values and ideas, and especially he liked the feeling of a university wall around him. He never was called on to make any practical decisions. He could go on thinking and dreaming and doing as he pleased. He left early one morning. Later I heard he went on a field trip with Professor Gates. He was gone for days. He made sure it was way out where no one at all could reach him. His words were few, but his looks, they will linger forevermore. The smile in his sad dark eyes, more tender than words could be. But I was nothing to him, though he was the world to me. Today and there in his garden strolled, all robed in her satins and lace. Lady Mary, so strange and cold, I couldn't stand it any longer, Ken. Who told you that I was here? I had to come back to you. I wouldn't have known a moment's peace all my life. But this is a hundred miles from nowhere. I kept thinking about you all the time. I couldn't sleep. It wasn't easy for me, either. 
Ken, we've got a chance to be happy. Let's not throw it away. Are you sure? I don't want to be sure of anything except that you love me. But I was nothing to him Though he was the world to me Today in his palace grand On his flower-strewn bed he died his Ken, put your arms around me. Oh, Ken, I want so to feel, I don't know, together again the way we were. You're so lovely, Winnie. For every woman in this world, Ken, there's only one man. So enchanting. When you marry for love, Ken, you're always happy. So seductive. Are you going to be nice again, Ken? You'll see now. And you'll be an angel about everything. Always. And we'll never disagree about anything at all. Never. And you won't forget my birthday? June 26th. <laughs> And promise you won't take me for granted. I promise. And you'll never get fat and bald. <laughs> never. And we'll always be in love, even when we're old. Always. Kiss? To what, Ken? What to? You say. To love. Good-looking, healthy, clever. A beautiful bride. She thinks she's in love with Ken. Intelligent, gifted, Certainly old enough to get married, to know his own mind. He thinks he's in love with Winnie. He likes her vivaciousness, but he doesn't realize it can't be bottled up and controlled. She likes his air of distinction, but she wants him to accept her taste. He likes her simplicity, but he wants her to be sophisticated and understand his complexities at the same time. She likes his romantic moodiness, but she wants him to be a steady provider, too. He likes her maternal qualities, but is not prepared to give up his freedom to really enjoy them. He likes her efficient practicality, but he doesn't want to have his wings clipped so he is down to earth along with her. She likes the idea of going to live with him in a new community, but she wants the people there to be like her own neighbors. She likes almost everything she knows about him, but lots of what she knows is in her own imagination. He's willing to promise the world, but he is probably unable to give even himself. What a lovely picture this bride and groom make. They might have found each other, but instead they remain strangers. Each is a dream in the other's mind. They don't want to accept each other as they really are. They would rather change each other to satisfy their own ambitions. That's why they are doomed to fail. The small building over which it towers has been a mecca for many who seek to serve their fellow men. In this building, headquarters of the American Friends Service Committee, a division of the Society of Friends, people work to demonstrate that brotherly love and a respect for human dignity can overcome the causes of misery and hatred. Many of the projects of the committee are designed to give young people an opportunity to understand the causes of social problems through study, through service, and by meeting and exchanging ideas with other young people in different circumstances and from different backgrounds. These subjects may range from a discussion of the United Nations to a consideration of the relationship between science and society. But the meeting usually wanders freely away from the basic subject to embrace the questions, opinions, and special interests of the students. Students frequently hold informal discussions about interesting things in their own countries. In this case, a German boy explains the background of National Socialism. Such informal discussions may lead in many directions. A German boy sneezes. An Indian says something in his own language and then explains that in his country it is customary to say, your beloved has remembered you when anyone sneezes. 
A professional dietitian supervises the menu in the kitchen, but students take turns in preparing the food and helping with the cooking. Frequently, individual students prepare their national dishes, of which none is more popular than the sukiyaki cooked by Yoshio. The dean of the seminar and his wife sit with their children to watch the dancing at a table which is decorated with a the theme of one world in every language. 